Chapter Five of The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Five. Quote, Nathaniel's coat, sir, was not fully made, and Gabriel's pumps were all unpinked in the heel. There was no link to color Peter's hat, and Walter's dagger was not come from sheathing. There were none fine but Adam, Ralph, and Gregory. Unquote. Shakespeare. After winding along the side of the mountain, the road on reaching the gentle declivity which lay at the base of the hill, turned at a right angle to its former course, and shot down an inclined plain directly into the village of Templeton. The rapid little stream that we have already mentioned was crossed by a bridge of hewn timber, which manifested by its rude construction and the unnecessary size of its framework, both the value of labor and the abundance of materials. This little torrent whose dark waters gushed over the limestones that lined its bottom, was nothing less than one of the many sources of the Susquehanna, a river to which the Atlantic herself has extended an open arm in welcome. It was at this point that the powerful team of Mr. Jones brought him up to the more sober steeds of our travelers. A small hill was risen, and Elizabeth, found herself at once amidst the incongruous dwellings of the village. The street was the ordinary width, notwithstanding the eye might embrace in one view thousands and ten thousands of acres, that were yet tenanted only by the beast of the forest. But such had been the will of her father, and such had also met the wishes of his followers. To them the road that made the most rapid approaches to the condition of the old, or as they expressed it, the down countries, was the most pleasant, and surely nothing could look more like civilization than a city, even if it lay in a wilderness. The width of the street, for so it was called, might have been one hundred feet, but the track of the slaves was much more limited. On either side of the highway were piled huge heaps of logs, that were daily increasing rather than diminishing in size, notwithstanding the enormous fires that might be seen through every window. The last object which Elizabeth gazed when they renewed their journey, after their encounter with Richard, was the sun, as it expanded in the refraction of the horizon, and over whose disk the dark umbrage of a pine was stealing, while it slowly sank behind the western hills but his setting rays darted along the openings of the mountain he was on, and lighted the shining covering of the birches, until their smooth and glossy coats nearly rivaled the mountain sides in color. The outline of each dark pine was delineated far in the depths of the forest, and the rocks, too smooth and too perpendicular to retain the snow that had fallen, brightened, as if smiling at the leave-taking of the luminary. But at each step as they descended, Elizabeth observed that they were leaving the day behind them. Even the heartless but bright rays of a December sun were missed as they glided into the gloom of the valley. Along the summits of the mountains in the eastern range, it is true, the light still lingered, receding step by step from the earth into the clouds, that were gathering with the evening mist above the limited horizon. But the frozen lake lay without a shadow on its bosom. The dwellings were becoming already gloomy and indistinct, and the woodcutters were shouldering their axes and preparing to enjoy throughout the long evening before them the comforts of those exhilarating fires that their labor had been supplying with fuel. They paused only to gaze at the passing sleighs, to lift their caps to Marmaduke, to exchange familiar nods with Richard, and each disappeared in his dwelling. 
the paper curtains dropped behind our travellers in every window, shutting from the air even the firelight of the cheerful apartments, and when the horses of her father turned with a rapid whirl into the open gate of the mansion-house, and nothing stood before her but the cold, dreary stone walls of the building as she approached them through an avenue of young and leafless poplars, Elizabeth felt as if all the loveliness of the mountain view had vanished like the fancies of a dream. Marmaduke retained so much of his early habits as to reject the use of bells, but the equipage of Mr. Jones came dashing through the gate after them, sending its jingling sounds through every cranny of the building, and in a moment the dwelling was in an uproar. On a stone platform of rather small proportions, considering the size of the building, Richard and Hiram had conjointly reared four little columns of wood, which in their turn supported the shingle roofs of the portico. This was the name that Mr. Jones had thought proper to give to a very plain covered entrance. The ascent to the platform was by five or six stone steps, somewhat hastily laid together, and which the frost had already begun to move from their symmetrical positions. But the evils of a cold climate and a superficial construction did not end there. As the steps lowered, the platform necessarily fell also, and the foundations actually left the superstructure suspended in the air, leaving an open space of a foot between the base of the pillars and the stone on which they had originally been placed. It was luckily for the whole fabric that the carpenter who did the manual part of the labor had fastened the canopy of this classic entrance so firmly to the side of the house that when the base deserted the superstructure in the manner we described, the pillars, for want of a foundation, were no longer of service to support the roof. The roof was able to uphold the pillars. Here was, indeed, an unfortunate gap left in the ornamental part of Richard's column, but like the widow in Aladdin's palace, it seemed only left in order to prove the fertility of its master's resources. The composite order again offered its advantages, and a second edition of the base was given, as the booksellers say, with additions and improvements. It was necessarily larger, and it was properly ornamented with moldings. Still, the steps continued to yield, and at the moment when Elizabeth turned to her father's door, a few rough wedges were driven under the pillars to keep them steady, and to prevent their weight from separating them from the pediment which they ought to have supported. From the great door which opened into the porch emerged two or three female domestics and one male. The latter was bareheaded, but evidently more dressed than usual, and on the whole was of no singular a formation and attire as to deserve a more minute description. He was about five feet in height, of a square and athletic frame, with a pair of shoulders that would have fitted a grenadier. His low stature was rendered the more striking by a bend forward that he was in the habit of assuming, for no apparent reason, unless it might be to give greater freedom to his arms in a particularly sweeping swing that they constantly practiced when their master was in motion. His face was long, of a fair complexion, burnt to a fiery red, with a snub nose, cocked to an inveterate pug, a mouth of enormous dimensions filled with white teeth, and a pair of blue eyes that seemed to look about them on surrounding objects with habitual contempt. His head composed full one-fourth of his whole length, and the cue that depended from its rear occupied another. He wore a coat of very light drab cloth, with buttons as large as dollars, bearing the impression of a foul anchor. The skirts were extremely long, reaching quite to the calf, and were broad in proportion. Beneath there were a vest and breeches of red plush, somewhat worn and soiled. He had shoes with large buckles, and stockings of blue and white stripes. 
This odd-looking figure reported himself to be a native of the county of Cornwall in the island of Great Britain. His boyhood had passed in the neighborhood of the tin mines, and his youth as the cabin boy of a smuggler between Falmouth and Guernsey. From this trade he had been impressed into the service of his king, and for the want of a better had been taken into the cabin first as a servant, and finally as steward to the captain. Here he acquired the art of making chowder, lobster, and one or two other sea dishes, and, as he was fond of saying, had an opportunity of seeing the world. With the exception of one or two outports in France, and an occasional visit to Portsmouth, Plymouth, and Deal, he had, in reality, seen no more of mankind, however, than if he had been riding a donkey in one of his native mines. But being discharged from the navy at the peace of eighty-three, he declared that, as he had seen all the civilized parts of the earth, he was inclined to make a trip to the wilds of America. We will not trace him in his brief wanderings under the influence of that spirit of immigration that sometimes induces a dapper cockney to quit his home and lands him, before the sound of cowbells is out of his ears, within the roar of the cataract of Niagara. But Shea only add that, at a very early day, even before Elizabeth had been sent to school, he had found his way into the family of Marmaduke Temple, where, owing to a combination of qualities that will be developed in the course of the tale, he held under Mr. Jones the office of Major Domo. The name of this worthy was Benjamin Penguillan, according to his own pronunciation but owing to a marvellous tale that he was in the habit of relating concerning the length of time he had to labor to keep his ship from sinking after rodney's victory he had universally acquired the nickname of ben pump by the side of benjamin and pressing forward as if a little jealous of her station stood a middle-aged woman dressed in calico rather violently contrasted in color with a tall meagre, shapeless figure, sharp features, and a somewhat acute expression of her physiognomy. Her teeth were mostly gone, and what did remain were of a tight yellow. The skin of her nose was drawn tightly over the member to hang in large wrinkles in her cheeks and about her mouth. She took snuff in such quantities as to create the impression that she owed the saffron of her lips and the adjacent parts to this circumstance. But it was the unvarying color of her whole face. She presided over the female part of the domestic arrangements, in the capacity of housekeeping, was a spinster, and bore the name of Remarkable Pettibone. To Elizabeth she was an entire stranger, having been introduced into the family since the death of her mother. In addition to these were three or four subordinate menials, mostly black, some appearing at the principal door, and some running from the end of the building where stood the entrance to the cellar kitchen. Beside these there was a general rush from Richard's kennel, accompanied with every canine tone from the howl of the wolf-dog to the perpetual bark of the terrier. The master received their boisterous salutations, with a variety of imitations from his own throat. When the dogs, probably from shame of being outdone, ceased their outcry. One stately, powerful mastiff, who wore round his neck a brass collar with M.T. engraved in large letters on the rim, alone was silent. He walked majestically amid the confusion, to the side of the judge, where, receiving a kind pat or two, he turned to Elizabeth, who even stooped to kiss him, as she called him kindly by the name of Old Brave. The animal seemed to know her as she ascended the steps, supported by Monsieur Lecoy and her father, in order to protect her from falling on the ice 
with which they were covered. He looked wistfully at her figure, and when the door was closed on the whole party, he laid himself in a kennel that was placed nigh by, as if conscious that the house contained some thing of additional value to guard. Elizabeth followed her father, who paused a moment to whisper a message to one of his domestics, into a large hall that was dimly lighted by two candles placed on high, old-fashioned brass candlesticks. The door closed, and the party were at once removed from an atmosphere that was nearly at zero to one of sixty degrees above. In the center of the hall stood an enormous stove, the sides of which appeared to be quivering with heat, from which a large straight pipe leading through the ceiling above carried off the smoke. An iron basin containing water was placed on this furnace, for such it only could be called, in order to preserve a proper humidity in the apartment. The room was carpeted and furnished with convenient substantial furniture, some of which was brought from the city, the remainder having been manufactured by the mechanics of Templeton. There was a sideboard of mahogany, inlaid with ivory and bearing enormous handles of glittering brass, and groaning under the piles of silver plate. Near it stood a set of prodigious tables, made of the wild cherry, to imitate the imported wood of the sideboard, but plain and without ornamentation of any kind. Opposite to these stood a smaller table, formed from a lighter-colored wood, through the grains of which the wavy lines of the curled maple of the mountains were beautifully undulating. Near to this, in a corner, stood a heavy, old-fashioned, brass-faced clock, encased in a high box of the dark hue of the black walnut from the seashore. An enormous settee or sofa, covered with light chintz, stretched along the walls for nearly twenty feet on one side of the hall and chairs of wood painted a light yellow with black lines that were drawn by no very steady hand were ranged opposite and in the intervals between the other pieces of furniture a fahrenheit's thermometer in a mahogany case and with a barometer annexed was hung against the wall at some distance from the stove which benjamin consulted every half hour with prodigious exactitude Two small glass chandeliers were suspended at equal distances between the stove and the outer doors, one of which opened at each end of the hall, and gilt lusters were affixed to the framework of the numerous side doors that led from the apartment. Some little display in architecture had been made in constructing these frames and casings, which were surmounted with pediments that bore each a little pedestal in its center. On these pedestals were small busts in blackened plaster of Paris. The style of the pedestals, as well as the selection of the bust, were all done to the taste of Mr. Jones. Only one stood Homer. A most striking likeness, Richard affirmed, as any one might see, for it was blind. Another bore the image of a smooth-visaged gentleman with a pointed beard, whom he called Shakespeare. A third ornament was an urn, which, from its shape, Richard was accustomed to say, intended to represent itself as holding the ashes of Dido. A fourth was certainly old Franklin, in his cap and spectacles. A fifth as surely bore the dignified composure of the face of Washington. A sixth was a nondescript representing a man with a shirt collar open, to use the language of Richard, with a laurel on his head, it was Julius Caesar or Dr. Faustus. There were good reasons for believing either. The walls were hung with a dark lead-colored English paper that represented Britannia weeping over the tomb of Wolfe. The hero himself stood at a little distance from the mourning goddess, and at the edge of the paper. Each width contained the figure with the slight exception of one arm of the general, which ran over on the next piece, 
so that when Richard essayed with his own hands to put together this delicate outline, some difficulties occurred that prevented a nice conjunction, and Britannia had reason to lament, in addition to the loss of her favorite's life, numberless cruel amputations of his right arm. The luckless cause of these unnatural divisions now announced his presence in the hall by a loud crack of his whip. "'Why, Benjamin, you, Ben Pump, is this the manner in which you receive the heiress?' he cried. "'Excuse him, cousin Elizabeth. The arrangements were too intricate to be trusted to every one. But now I am here. Things will go on better. Come, light up, Mr. Penguilon. Light up, light up, and let us see one another's faces. Well, Duke, I have brought home your deer. What is to be done with that, huh? By the Lord Squire, commenced Benjamin in reply, first giving his mouth a wipe with the back of his hand. If this here thing have been ordered some at earlier in the day, I might have got up do ye see to your liking? I had mustered all hands, and was exercising candles when you hove in sight. But when the women heard your bells, they started an end as if they were riding the boat Swain's colt. And if so be, there is that man in the house who can bring up a parcel of women when they have got headway on them, until they have run out of the end of the rope. His name is not Benjamin Pump. But Miss Betsy here must have altered more than a privateer in disguise, since she has got on her woman's duds. If she will take offense with an old fellow for the small matter of lighting a few candles? Elizabeth and her father continued silent, for both experienced the same sensation on entering the hall. The former had resided one year in the building before she left home for school, and the figure of its lamented mistress was missed by both husband and child. But candles had been placed in the chandeliers and lustres, and the attendants were so far recovered from surprise as to recollect their use. The oversight was immediately remedied, and in a minute the apartment was a blaze of light. The slight melancholy of our heroine and her father was banished by this brilliant interruption and the whole party began to lay aside the numberless garments they had worn in the air. During this operation Richard kept a desultory dialogue with the different domestics, occasionally throwing out a remark to the judge concerning the deer. But as his conversation at such moments was much like an accompaniment on a piano, a thing that is heard without being attended to, we will not undertake the task of recording his diffuse discourse. The re instant that remarkable Pettibone had executed her portion of the labor of illuminating, she returned to a position near Elizabeth with the apparent motive of receiving the clothes that the other threw aside, but in reality to examine with an air of curiosity, not unmixed with jealousy, the appearance of the lady who was to supplant her in the administration of their domestic economy. The housekeeper felt a little appalled when, after cloaks, coats, shawls, and socks had been taken off in succession, the large black hood was removed, and dark ringlets, shining like the raven's wing, fell from her head and left the sweet but commanding features of the young lady exposed to view. Nothing could be fairer and more spotless than the forehead of Elizabeth, and preserve the appearance of life and health. Her nose would have been called Grecian, but for a softly rounded swell that gave in character to the feature what it lost in beauty. Her mouth, at first sight, seemed only made for love, but the instant that its muscles moved, every expression that woman's dignity could utter played around it with the flexibility of female grace. It spoke not only to the ear, but to the eye so much added to a form of exquisite proportions, rather full and rounded for her years, and of the tallest medium height she inherited from her mother. Even the color of her eye, the arched brows, and the long silken lashes came from the same source, but its expression was her father's. Inert and composed, it was soft, benevolent, and attractive, 
but it could be roused, and that without much difficulty. At such moments it was still beautiful, though it was a little severe. As the last shawl fell aside, and she stood dressed in a rich blue riding habit that fitted her form with the nicest exactness, her cheeks burning with roses that bloomed the richer for the heat of the hall, and her eyes lightly diffused with moisture that rendered their ordinary beauty more dazzling, and with every feature of her speaking countenance illuminated by the lights that flared around her, remarkable felt that her own power had ended. The business of unrobing had been simultaneous. Marmaduke appeared in a suit of plain neat black, Monsieur Lecoy in a coat of snuff color, covering a vest of embroidery with breeches and silk stockings, and buckles that were commonly thought to be of paste. Major Hartman wore a coat of sky blue, with large brass buttons, a club wig, and boots, and Mr. Richard Jones had set off his dapper little form with a frock of bottle green with bullet buttons, by one of which the sides were united over his well-rounded waist. Opening above so as to show a jacket of red cloth with an undervest of flannel faced with green velvet, and below so as to exhibit a pair of buckskin breeches with long, soiled, white top boots and spurs, one of the latter a little bent from its recent attacks on the stool. When the young lady had extricated herself from her garments, she was at liberty to gaze about her, and to examine not only the household over which she was to preside, but also the air and manner in which the domestic arrangements were conducted. Although there was much incongruity in the furniture and appearance of the hall, there was nothing mean. The floor was carpeted, even in its remotest corners. The brass candlesticks, the gilt lusters, and the glass chandeliers, whatever might be their keeping as to proprietary and taste, were admirably kept as to all the purposes of use and comfort. They were clean and glittering in the strong light of the apartment. Compared with the chill aspect of the December night without, the warmth and brilliancy of the apartment produced an effect that was not unlike enchantment. Her eye had not time to detect in detail the little errors which in truth existed, but was glancing around her in delight, when an object arrested her view that was in strong contrast to the smiling faces and neatly attired personages who had thus assembled to do honor to the heiress of Templeton. In the corner of the hall, near the grand entrance, stood the young hunter, unnoticed, and for the moment apparently forgotten. But even the forgetfulness of the judge, which, under the influence of strong emotion, had banished the recollection of the wound of his stranger, seemed surpassed by the absence of mind in the youth himself. On entering the apartment, he had mechanically lifted his cap, and exposed a head covered with hair that rivaled in color and gloss the locks of Elizabeth. Nothing could have wrought a greater transformation than the single act of removing the rough fox-skin cap. If there was much that was prepossessing in the countenance of the young hunter, there was something even noble in the rounded outlines of his head and brow. The very air and manner with which the member haughtily maintained itself over the coarse and even wild attire in which the rest of his frame was clad, bespoke not only familiarity with a splendor that in these new settlements was thought to be unequaled, but something very like contempt also. The hand that held the cap rested lightly on the little ivory-mounted piano of Elizabeth, with neither rustic restraint nor obtrusive vulgarity. A little finger touched the instrument as if accustomed to dwell on such places. His other arm was extended to its utmost length, and the hand grasped the barrel of his long rifle with something like convulsive energy. The act and the attitude were both involuntary and evidently proceeded from a feeling much deeper than that of vulgar surprise. His appearance, connected as it was with the rough exterior of his dress, rendered him entirely distinct from the busy group who were moving across the other end of the long hall, occupied in receiving the travelers and exchanging their welcomes. And Elizabeth, 
continued to gaze at him in wonder. The contraction of the stranger's brows increased as his eyes moved slowly from one object to another. For moments the expression of his countenance was fierce, and then, again, it seemed to pass away in some painful emotion. The arm that was extended bent and brought the hand nigh to his face. When his head dropped upon it and concealed the wonderfully speaking lineaments. We forget there, sir, the strange gentleman, for her life, Elizabeth could not call him otherwise, whom we have brought here for assistance, and to whom we owe every attention. All eyes were instantly turned in the direction of those of the speaker, and the youth rather proudly elevated his head again while he answered, My wound is trifling and I believe that Judge Temple sent for a physician the moment we arrived. Certainly, said Marmaduke. I have not forgotten the object of thy visit, young man, nor the nature of my debt. Ah! Oh, exclaimed Richard, with something of a waggish leer. Thou owest the lad for the venison. I suppose that thou killed cousin Duke. Marmaduke, Marmaduke, that was a marvelous tale of thine about the buck. Here, young man, are two dollars for the deer, and Judge Temple can do no less than pay the doctor. I shall charge you nothing for my services, but you shall not fare the worst for that. Come, come, Duke, don't be downhearted about it. If you miss the buck, you contrive to shoot this po poor fellow through a pine tree. Now I own that you have beat me. I never did such a thing in all my life. And I hope never will returned the judge, if you are to experience the uneasiness that I have suffered. But be of good cheer, my young friend. The injury must be small, as thou movest thy arm with apparent freedom. Don't make the matter worse, Duke, by pretending to talk about surgery, interrupted Mr. Jones with a contemptuous wave of the hand. It's a science that can only be learned by practice. You know that my grandfather was a doctor, but you haven't got a drop of medical blood in your veins. These kind of things run in families. All my family by my father's side had a knack at physic. There was only my uncle that was killed. There was my uncle that was killed in Brandywine. He died as easy as any other man of the regiment, just from knowing how to hold his breath naturally. Few men know how to breathe naturally. I doubt not, Dickon returned the judge, meeting the bright smile which, in spite of itself, stole over the stranger's features, that thy family thoroughly understand the art of letting life slip through their fingers. Richard heard him quite coolly, and putting a hand in either pocket of his surcoat, so as to press forward the skirts, began to whistle a tune. But the desire to reply overcame his philosophy, and with great heat he exclaimed, you may affect to smile, Judge Temple, at hereditary virtues, if you please, but there is not a man on your patent who don't know better. Here, even this young man who has never seen anything but bears and deer and woodchucks knows better than to believe virtues are not transmitted in fa families, don't you, friend? I believe that vice is not, said the stranger abruptly, his eyes glancing from the father to the daughter. The squire is right, Judge observed Benjamin, with a knowing nod of his head toward Richard, that bespoke the cordiality between them. Now in the old country the king's majesty touches for the evil, and that is a disorder that the greatest doctor in the fleet, or for the matter of that admiral either, can't cure. Only the king's majesty, or a man that's been hanged. Yes, the squire's right, for if so be that he wasn't, how is it that the seventh son always is a doctor? whether he ships for the cockpit or not. Now when he fell in with the Monshears, under de Grouse, do ye see, we hid abroad of us a doctor. Very well, Benjamin, interrupted Elizabeth, glancing her eyes from the hunter to Monsieur Le Coy, who was most politely attending to what fell from each individual in succession. You shall tell me of that, and all your entertaining adventures together. Just now a room must be prepared in which the arm of this gentleman can be dressed. I will attend to that myself, cousin Elizabeth, observed Richard. 
somewhat haughtily. The young man will not suffer because Marmaduke chooses to be a little obstinate. Follow me, my friend, and I will examine the hurt myself. It will be well to wait for the physician, said the hunter coldly. He cannot be distant. Richard paused and looked at the speaker, a little astonished at the language, and a good deal appalled at the refusal. He construed the latter to, into an act of hostility, and placing his hands in the pockets again, he walked up to Mr. Gaunt, and putting his face close to the countenance of the divine, said in an undertone, Now mark my words. There will be a story among the settlers that all our necks would have been broken but for that fellow, as if I did not know how to drive. Why, you might have turned the horses yourself, sir. Nothing was easier. It was only pulling hard to the nigh rein, and touching off the flank of the leader. I hope, my dear sir, you are not at all hurt by the upset the lad gave us. The reply was interrupted by the entrance of the village physician. End of chapter 5 This recording by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania, in January of 2009. Chapter 6 of The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 6 Quote and about his shells a beggarly account of empty boxes, green earthen pots, bladders, and musty seeds, remnants of pack-thread, and old cakes of roses, were thinly scattered to make up a show." Unquote. Shakespeare Dr. Elanthon Todd, for such was the name of the man of physic, was commonly thought to be among the settlers a gentleman of great mental endowments and he was assuredly of rare personal proportions. In height, he measured, without his shoes, exactly six feet and four inches. His hands, feet, and knees corresponded in every respect with his formidable stature, but every other part of his frame appeared to have been intended for a man several sizes smaller, if we accept the length of the limbs. His shoulders were square, in one sense at least, being at a right line from one side to the other, but they were so narrow that the long dangling arms they supported seemed to issue out of his back. His neck possessed, in an eminent degree, the property of length to which we have alluded, and it was topped by a small bullet head that exhibited on one side a bush of bristling brown hair, and on the other a short twinkling visage that appeared to maintain a constant struggle with itself in order to look wise. He was the youngest son of a farmer in the western part of Massachusetts, who, being in somewhat easy circumstances, had allowed this boy to shoot up to the height we have mentioned without the ordinary interruptions of field labor, wood chopping, and other such toils as were imposed on his brothers. El Nathan was indebted for this exemption from labor, in some measure, to his extraordinary growth, which, leaving him pale, inanimate, and listless, induced his tender mother to pronounce him a sickly boy, and one that was not equal to work, but who might earn a living comfortably enough by taking to pleading law, or turning minister, or doctoring, or some such like easy calling. Still, there was great uncertainty which of these vocations the youth was best endowed to fill, but having no other employment, the stripling was constantly lounging about the homestead, munching green apples and hunting for sorrel, 
when the same sagacious eye that had brought to light his latent talents seized upon this circumstance as a clue to his future path through the turmoils of the world. Elnathan was cut out for a doctor. She knew, for he was forever digging for herbs and tasting all kinds of things that growed about the lots. Then again, he had a natural love for doctor stuff, for when she had left the bilious pills out for her man, all nicely covered with maple sugar, just ready to take, Nathan had come in and swallowed them for all the world as if they were nothing, while Ichabod, her husband, could never get one down without making such desperate faces that it was awful to look on. This discovery decided the matter. Elnathan, then about fifteen, was much like a wild colt, caught and trimmed by clipping his bushy locks, dressed in a suit of homespun, dyed in the butternut bark, furnished with a New Testament and a Webster spelling book, and sent to school. As the boy was by nature quite shrewd enough, and had previously at odd times laid foundations of reading, writing, and arithmetic, he was soon conspicuous in the school for his learning. The delighted mother had the gratification of hearing from the lips of the master that her son was a prodigious boy, and far above all his class. He also thought that the youth had a natural love for doctoring, as he had known him frequently advise the smaller children against eating too much, and, once or twice, when the ignorant little things had persevered in opposition to Elnathan's advice, he had known her son empty the school baskets with his own mouth to prevent the consequences. Soon after this comfortable declaration from his schoolmaster, the lad was removed to the house of the village doctor, a gentleman whose early career had not been unlike that of our hero, where he was to be seen sometimes watering a horse, at others watering medicines, blue, yellow, and red. Then again he might be noticed lolling under an apple tree, with Rudiman's Latin grammar in his hand, and a corner of Denman's midwifery sticking out of a pocket, for his instructor held it absurd to teach his pupil how to dispatch a patient regularly from this world before he knew how to bring him into it. This kind of life continued for a twelve-month, when he suddenly appeared at a meeting in a long coat, and well did it deserve the name, of black homespun, with little booties, bound with an uncovered calfskin, for the want of red morocco. Soon after he was seen shaving with a dull razor, three or four months had scarce elapsed before several elderly ladies were observed hastening toward the house of a poor woman in the village, while others were running to and fro in great apparent distress. One or two boys were mounted bareback on horses and sent off at speed in various directions. Several indirect questions were put concerning the place where the physician was last seen but all would not do, and at length Elnathan was seen issuing from his door with a very grave air preceded by a little white-headed boy, out of breath, trotting before him. The following day the youth appeared in the street, as the highway was called, and the neighborhood was much edified by the additional gravity of his air. The same week he bought a new razor, and the succeeding Sunday he entered the meeting-house with a red silk handkerchief in his hand, and with an extremely demure countenance. In the evening he called upon a young woman of his own class in life, for there were no others to be found, and when he was left alone with the fair, he was called for the first time in his life Dr. Todd by her prudent mother. The ice once broken in this manner, Elnathan, was greeted from every mouth with his official appellation. Another year passed under the superintendence of the same master, during which the young physician had the credit of riding with the old doctor, although they were generally observed to travel different roads. At the end of that period, 
Dr. Todd, attained his legal majority. He then took a jaunt to Boston to purchase medicines, and, as some intimated, to walk the hospital. We know not how the latter might have been, but, if true, he soon walked through it, for he returned within a fortnight, bringing with him a suspicious-looking box that smelled powerfully of brimstone. The next Sunday he was married, and the following morning he entered a one-horse sleigh with his bride, having before him the box we have mentioned, with another filled with homemade household linen, a paper-covered trunk with a red umbrella lashed to it, a pair of quite new saddle-bags, and a hand-box. The next intelligence that his friends received of the bride and bridegroom was that the latter was settled in the new countries, and well-to-do as a doctor in Templeton, in New York State. If Templer would smile at the qualifications of Marmaduke to fill the judicial seat he occupied, we were certain that a graduate of Leyden or Edinburgh would be extremely amused with this true narration of the servitude of Elnathan in the temple of Escalapius. But the same consolation was afforded to both the jurist and the leech for Dr. Todd was quite as much on a level with his own peers of the profession in that country, as was Marmaduke with his brethren on the bench. Time and practice did wonders for the physician. He was naturally humane, but possessed no small share of moral courage, or in other words, he was chary of the lives of his patients, and never tried uncertain experiments on such members of society as were considered useful. But once or twice, when a luckless vagrant had come under his care, he was a little addicted to trying the effects of every file in his saddle-bag on the stranger's condition. Happily, their number was small, and in most cases their natures innocent. By these means, Elnathan had acquired a certain degree of knowledge in fevers and aches, and could talk with judgment concerning intermittents, remittents, tertians, quotidians, etc. In certain cutaneous disorders, very prevalent in the new settlements, he was considered to be infallible. And there was no woman on the patent, but would as soon think of becoming a mother without a husband as without the assistance of Dr. Todd. In short, he was rearing on this foundation of sand a superstructure cemented by practice, though composed of somewhat brittle materials. He, however, occasionally renewed his elementary studies, and with the observation of a shrewd mind, was comfortably applying his practice to his theory. In surgery, having the least experience, and it being a business that spoke directly to the senses, he was most apt to distrust his own powers. But he had applied oils to several burns, cut around the roots of sundry defective teeth, and sewed up the wounds of numberless woodchoppers, with considerable eclat. When an unfortunate jobber suffered a fracture of his leg by the tree that he had been falling, it was on this occasion that our hero encountered the greatest trial his nerves and moral feeling had ever sustained. In the hour of need, however, he was not found wanting. Most of the amputations in the new settlements, and they were quite frequent, were performed by some one practitioner who, possessing originally a reputation, was enabled by his circumstances to acquire an experience that rendered him deserving of it, and Elnathan had been present at one or two of these operations. But, on the present occasion, the man of practice was not to be obtained, and the duty fell, as a matter of course, to the share of Mr. Todd. He went to work with a kind of blind desperation, observing at the same time all the externals of decent gravity and great skill. The sufferer's name was Milligan, 
and it was to his event that Richard alluded, when he spoke of assisting the doctor at an amputation by holding the leg. The limb was certainly cut off, and the patient survived the operation. It was, however, two years before Milligan ceased to complain that they had buried the leg in so narrow a box that it was straightened for room. He could feel the pain shooting up from the inhumed fragment into the living members. Marmaduke suggested that the fault might lie in the arteries and nerves, but Richard, considering the amputation as a part of his own handiwork, strongly repelled the insinuation, at the same time declaring that he had often heard of men who would tell when it was about to rain by the toes of amputated limbs. After two or three years notwithstanding, Milligan's complaints gradually diminished. The leg was dug up and a larger box furnished, and from that hour no one had heard the sufferer utter another complaint on the subject. This gave the public great confidence in Dr. Todd, whose reputation was hourly increasing and luckily for his patients, his information also. Notwithstanding Dr. Todd's practice and his success with the leg, he was not a little appalled on entering the hall of the mansion house. It was glaring with the light of day. It looked so imposing, compared with the hastily built and scantily furnished apartments which he frequented in his ordinary practice, and contained so many well-dressed persons and anxious faces that his usually firm nerves were a good deal discomposed. He had heard from the messenger who summoned him that it was a gunshot wound, and had come from his own home wading through the snow, with his saddle-bags thrown over his arm, while separated arteries, penetrated lungs, and injured vitals were whirling through his brain, as if he were stalking over a field of battle, instead of Judge Temple's peaceable enclosure. The first object that met his eye as he moved into the room was Elizabeth in her riding habit, richly laced with gold cord, her fine form bending toward him, and her face expressing deep anxiety in every one of its beautiful features. The enormous knees of the physician struck each other with a noise that was audible, for in the absent state of his mind he mistook her for a general officer, perforated with bullets, hastening from the field of battle to implore assistance. The delusion, however, was but momentary, and his eye glanced rapidly from the daughter to the earnest dignity of the father's countenance, thence to the busy strut of Richard, who was cooling his impatience at the hunter's indifference to his assistance by pacing the hall and cracking his whip. From him to the Frenchman, who had stood for several minutes unheeded with a chair for the lady, thence to Major Hartman, who was coolly lighting a pipe, three feet long, by a candle in one of the chandeliers, thence to Mr. Grant, who was turning over a manuscript with much earnestness at one of the lusters, thence to Remarkable, who stood with her arms demurely folded before her, surveying, with a look of admiration and envy, the dress and beauty of the young lady, and from her to Benjamin, who with his feet standing wide apart, and his arms akimbo, was balancing his square little body with the indifference of one who is accustomed to wounds and bloodshed. All these seemed to be unhurt, and the operator began to breathe more frequently. But, before he had time to take a second look, the judge, advancing, shook him kindly by the hand and spoke. Thou art welcome, my good sir, quite welcome indeed. Here is a youth whom I have unfortunately wounded in shooting a deer this evening, and requires some of thy assistance. Shooting a deer, Duke, interrupted Richard, shooting at a deer. Who do you think can prescribe unless he knows the truth of the case? It is always so with some people. They think a doctor can be deceived with the same impunity as another man. Shooting at a deer, truly, returned the judge, smiling. Although it is by no means certain 
that I did not aid in destroying the buck. But the youth is injured by my hand, be that as it may, and it is thy skill that must cure him, and my pocket shall amply reward thee for it. Tis very good things to depend on, observed Monsieur Lecoy, bowing politely with a sweep of his head to the judge and to the practitioner. I thank you, Monsieur, returned the judge, but we keep the young man in pain. Remarkable. Thou wilt please to provide linen for lint and bandages. This remark caused the cessation of the compliments, and induced the physician to turn an inquiring eye in the direction of his patient. During the dialogue the young hunter had thrown aside his overcoat, and now stood clad in a plain suit of the common, light-colored homespun of the country, that was evidently but recently made. His hand was on the lapels of his coat, in the attitude of removing the garment, when he suddenly suspended the movement and looked toward the commiserating Elizabeth, who was standing in an unchanged posture, too much observed with her anxious feelings to heed his actions. A slight color appeared on the brow of the youth. Possibly the sight of blood may alarm the lady. I will retire to another room while the wound is dressing. By no means, said Dr. Todd, who, having discovered that his patient was far from being a man of importance, felt much emboldened to perform the duty. The strong light of these candles is favorable to the operation, and it is seldom that we hard students enjoy good eyesight. While speaking, Elizabeth placed a pair of large iron-rimmed spectacles on his face, where they drooped, as it were, by long practice, to the extremity of his slim pug nose, and, if they were of no service as assistance to his eyes, neither were they any impediment to his vision, for his little gray organs were twinkling above them like two stars emerging from the envious cover of a cloud. The action was unheeded by all but remarkable, who observed to Benjamin, Dr. Todd is a comely man to look on, and this bit pretty. How well he seems in spectacles, I declare. They give a grand look to a body's face. I have quite a mind to try them myself. The speech of the stranger recalled the recollection of Miss Temple, who started as if from deep abstraction and coloring excessively. She motioned to a young woman who served in the capacity of maid, and retired with an air of womanly reserve. The field was now left to the physician and his patient, while the different personages who remained gathered around the latter, with faces expressing the various degrees of interest that each one felt in his condition. Major Hartman alone retained his seat, where he continued to throw out vast quantities of smoke, now rolling his eyes up to the ceiling, as if musing on the uncertainty of life, and now bending them on the wounded man, with an expression that bespoke some consciousness of his situation. In the meantime, El Nathan, to whom the sight of a gunshot wound was a perfect novelty, commenced his preparations with a solemnity and care that were worthy of the occasion. An old shirt was procured by Benjamin, and placed in the hand of the other, who tore diverse bandages from it, with an exactitude that marked both his own skill and the importance of the operation. When this preparatory measure was taken, Dr. Todd selected a piece of the shirt with great care, and handing to Mr. Jones, without moving a muscle, said, Here, Squire Jones, you are well acquainted with these things. Will you please to scrape the lint? It should be fine and soft, you know, my dear sir, and be cautious that no cotton gets in, or it may pison the wound. Their shirt has been made with cotton thread, but you can easily pick it out. Richard assumed the office with a nod at his cousin, and said quite plainly, You see, this fellow can't get along without me, and began to scrape the linen on his knee with great diligence. A table was now spread with vials, boxes of salve, and diverse surgical instruments, 
as the latter appeared in succession from a case of red morocco, their owner held up each implement to the strong light of the chandelier near to which he stood, and examined it with the nicest care. A red silk handkerchief was frequently applied to the glittering steel, as if to remove from the polished surfaces the last impediment which might exist to the most delicate operation. After the rather scantily furnished pocket case which contained these instruments was exhausted, the physician turned to his saddle-bags, and produced various vials filled with liquids of the most radiant colors. These were arranged in due order by the side of the murderous saws, knives, and scissors. When Elnathan stretched his long body to its utmost elevation, placing his hand on the small of his back as if for support, and looked about him to discover what effect this display of professional skill was likely to produce on the spectators. "'Upon my word, doctor,' observed Major Hartman, with a roguish roll of his little black eyes, but with every other feature of his face, a state of perfect rest. "'Put you have a very pretty pocket-book of tools there, and your doctor stuff glitters, as if was pitier for the eyes as per the belly. Elnathan gave him one that one might have equally taken for that kind of noise which cowards are said to make in order to awaken their dormant courage, or for a natural effort to clear the throat. If for the latter it was successful, for turning his face to the veteran German, he said, Very true, Major Hartman, very true, sir. A prudent man will always strive to make his remedies agreeable to the eyes though they may not altogether suit the stomach. It is no small part of our art, sir, and he now spoke with the confidence of a man who understood his subject, to reconcile the patient to what is for his own good, though at the same time it may be unpalatable. Certain Dr. Todd is right, said Remarkable, and has scripture for what he says. The Bible tells us how things may be sweet to the mouth and bitter to the innards. True, true, interrupted the judge, a little impatiently. But here is a youth who needs no deception to lure him to his own benefit. I see by his eye that he fears nothing more than delay. The stranger had, without assistance, bared his own shoulder, when the slight perforation produced by the passage of the buckshot was plainly visible. The intense cold of the evening had stopped the bleeding, and Dr. Todd, casting a furtive glance at the wound, thought it by no means so formidable affair as he had anticipated. Thus encouraged, he approached his patient, and made some indication of an intention to trace the route that had been taken by the lead. Remarkable often found occasions in after days to recount the minutia of that celebrated operation, and when she arrived at this point she commonly proceeded as follows. And then the doctor took out of the pocket-book a long thing like a knitting-needle, with a button fastened to the end of it, and then he pushed it into the wound, and then the young man looked awful, and then I thought I should have swained away. I felt in stitch a dispute taken and then the doctor run it through his shoulder and shoved the bullet out on the other side. And so Dr. Todd cured the young man of a ball that the judge had shot into him. For all the world as easy as I could pick out a splinter with my darning needle. Such were the impressions of Remarkable on the subject, and such doubtless were the opinions of most of those who felt it necessary to entertain a species of religious veneration for the skill of Elnathan, but such was far from the truth. When the physician attempted to introduce the instrument described by Remarkable, he was repulsed by the stranger, with a good deal of decision and some little contempt in his manner. "'I believe, sir,' he said, "'that a probe is not necessary. The shot has missed the bone, and has passed directly through the arm to the opposite side where it remains but skin-deep, 
and whence, I should think, it might be easily extracted. The gentleman knows best, said Dr. Todd, laying down the probe with the air of a man who had assumed it merely in compliance with forms, and turning to Richard, he fingered the lint with the appearance of great care and foresight. Admirably well scraped, Squire Jones. It is about the best lint I have ever seen. I want your assistance, my good sir, to hold the patient's arm while I make an incision for the ball. Now I rather guess there is not another gentleman present who could scrape the lint so well as Squire Jones. Such things run in families, observed Richard, rising with alacrity to render the desired assistance. My father and my grandfather before him were both celebrated for their knowledge of surgery. They were not, like Marmaduke here, puffed up with an accidental thing, such as the time he drew in the hip joint of the man who was thrown from his horse. That was the fall before you came into the settlement, doctor. But they were men who were taught the thing regularly, spending half their lives in learning those little niceties, though. For the matter of that, my grandfather was a college-bred physician, and the rest of the colony, too, that is, in his neighborhood. So it is with the world, squire, cried Benjamin. If so be that a man wants to walk the quarter-deck with credit, do you see? and with regular built swabs on his shoulder, he mustn't think to do it by getting in at the cabin windows. There are two ways to get into a top besides the lubber holes. The true way to walk aft is to begin forward, though if he only be a humble way like myself, do you see, which was from being only a handler of top-gallant sails and a stower of the flying jib, to keeping the key of the captain's locker. Benjamin speaks quite to the purpose, continued Richard. I dare say he has often seen shot extracted in the different ships in which he has served. Suppose we get him to hold the basin. He must be used to the sight of blood. That he is, squire, that he is, interrupted the civident steward. Many's the good shot round double-headed and grape that I've seen the doctors at work on. For the matter of what, I was in a boat alongside the ship, when they cut out the twelve-pound shot from the thigh of the captain of the footy wrong, one of Monsieur Le Croix's countrymen. Footnote. It is possible that the reader may start at this declaration of Benjamin, but those who have lived in the new settlements of America are too much accustomed to hear these European exploits to doubt it. And footnote. A twelve-pound ball from the thigh of a human being? Examined Mr. Grant with great simplicity, dropping the sermon he was again reading and raising his spectacles to the top of his forehead. A twelve-pounder, echoed Benjamin, stirring around him with much confidence. A twelve-pounder, I, a twenty-four-pound shot, can easily be taken from a man's body, if so be a doctor only knows how. There's Squire Jones now. Ask him, sir. He reads all the books. Ask him if he never fell in with a page that keeps the reckoning of such things. Certainly more important operations than that have been performed, observed Richard. The Encyclopedia mentions much more incredible circumstances than that, as I dare say you know, Dr. Todd. Certainly. There are incredible tales told in the Encyclopedias returned Elnathan, though I cannot say I have ever seen myself anything larger than a musket-ball extracted. During this discourse an incision had been made through the skin of the young hunter's soldier, and the lead was laid bare. Elnathan took a pair of glittering forceps, and was in the act of applying them to the wound, when the sudden motion of the patient caused the shot to fall out of itself. The long arm and broad hand of the operator were now of singular service, for the latter expanded itself and caught the lead, while at the same time an extremely ambiguous motion was made by its brother, as to leave it doubtful to the spectators how great was its agency in releasing the shot. Richard, however, put the matter at rest by exclaiming, "'Very neatly done, doctor!' I have never seen a shot more neatly extracted, 
and I dare say Benjamin will say the same. Why, considering, returned Benjamin, I must say that it was shipshape and brister fashion. Now all that the doctor has to do is to clap a couple of plugs in the holes, and the lad will float in any gale that blows in these here hills. I thank you, sir, for what you have done, said the youth, with a little distance. But here is a man who will take me under his care and spare you all, gentlemen, any further trouble on my account. The whole group turned their heads in surprise, and beheld standing at one of the distant doors of the hall the person of Indian John. End of chapter 6 This recording by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania, in January of 2009. Chapter 7 of The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 7 Quote from Susquehanna's utmost springs, where savage tribes pursue their game, his blanket tied with yellow strings, the shepherd of the forest came. Unquote. By Freneau. Before the Europeans, or, to use a more significant term, the Christians, dispossessed the original owners of the soil, all that section of the country which contains the New England states, and those of the middle, which lie east of the mountains, was occupied by two great nations of Indians, from whom had descended numberless tribes. But as the original distinctions between these nations were marked by a difference in language, as well as by repeated and bloody wars, they were never known to amalgamate until after the power and in inroads of the whites had reduced some of the tribes to a state of dependence that rendered not only their political, but, considering the wants and habits of a savage, their animal existence also extremely precarious. These two great divisions consisted, on the one side, of the five, or, or as they were afterward called, the six nations, and their allies, and on the other, the Lenny Lenape, or Delawares, with the numerous and powerful tribes that owned that nation as their grandfather. The former was generally called by the Anglo-Americans Iroquois, or the Six Nations, or sometimes Mingos. Their appellation among their rivals seems generally have been the Mengue or Mogwa. They consisted of the tribes, or as their allies were fond of asserting, in order to raise their consequence of the several nations of the Mohawks, the Oneidas, the Onondagas, Cayugas, and Senecas, who ranked in the confederation in the order in which they are named. The Tuscaroras were ad admitted to this union near a century after its foundation, and thus completed the number of six. Of the Lenny Lenape, or as they were called by the whites, from the circumstances of their holding their great council fire on the banks of that river, the Delaware Nation, the principal tribes, besides that which bore the generic name, were Mahicani, Mohicans, or Mohegans, and the Nanticokes, or Nentigos. Of these, the latter held the country along the waters of the Chesapeake and the seashore, while the Mohegans occupied the district between the Hudson and the ocean, including much of New England. Of course, these two tribes were the first who were dispossessed of their lands by the Europeans. The wars of a portion of the latter are celebrated among us as the wars of King Philip, but the peaceful policy of William Penn, or Mingwon, as he was termed by the natives, 
effected its object with less difficulty, though not with less certainty. As the natives gradually disappeared from the country of the Mohicans, some scattering families sought a refuge around the council fire of the mother tribe, or the Delawares. This people had been induced to suffer themselves to be called women by their old enemies, the Mingos or Iroquois, after the latter having in vain tried the effects of hostility, had recourse in artifice in order to prevail over their rivals. According to this declaration, the Delawares were to cultivate the arts of peace, and to entrust their defenses entirely to the men or warlike tribes of the Six Nations. This state of things continued until the War of the Revolution, when the Lenny Lenape formally asserted their independence and fearlessly declared that they were again men. But in a government so peculiarly republican as the Indian polity, it was not at all times an easy task to restrain its members within the rules of the nation. Several fierce and renowned warriors of the Mohicans, finding the conflict with the whites to be in vain, sought a refuge with their grandfather, and brought with them the feelings and principles that had so long distinguished them in their own tribe. These chieftains kept alive, in some measure, the martial spirit of the Delawares, and would, at times, lead small parties against their ancient enemies, or such other foes as incurred their resentment. Among these warriors was one race particularly famous for their prowess, and for those qualities that render an Indian hero celebrated. But war, time, disease, and want had conspired to thin their number, and the sole representative of this once renowned family now stood in the hall of Marmaduke Temple. He had for a long time been an associate of the white men, particularly in their wars, and having been at the season when his services were of importance much noticed and flattered, he turned Christian and was baptized by the name of John. He had suffered severely in his family during the recent war, having had every soul to whom he was allied cut off by an inroad of the enemy and when the last lingering remnant of his nation extinguished their fires among the hills of the Delaware, he alone had remained, with a determination of laying his bones in that country where his fathers had so long lived and governed. It was only, however, within a few months that he had appeared among the mountains that surrounded Templeton. To the hut of the old hunter he seemed peculiarly welcome, and, as the habits of the leather-stocking were so nearly assimilated to those of the savages, the conjunction of their interests excited no surprise. They resided in the same cabin, ate of the same food, and were chiefly occupied in the same pursuits. We have already mentioned the baptismal name of this ancient chief but in his conversation with Natty, held in the language of the Delawares, he was heard uniformly to call himself Chingachgook, which interpreted means the great snake. This name he had acquired in his youth by his skill and prowess in war, but when his brows began to wrinkle with time, and he stood alone, the last of his family and his particular tribe, the few Delawares who yet continued about the headwaters of their river gave him the mournful appellation of Mohegan. Perhaps there was something of deep feeling excited in the bosom of this inhabitant of the forest by the sound of a name that recalled the idea of his nation in ruins, for he seldom used it himself. Never. Indeed, excepting on the most solemn occasions, but the settlers had united, according to the Christian custom, his baptismal with his national name, and to him he was generally known as John Mohegan, 
or more familiarly as Indian John. From his long association with the white men, the habits of Mohegan were a mixture of the civilized and savage states, though there was certainly a strong preponderance in favor of the latter. In common with all his people who dwelt within the influence of the Anglo-Americans, he had acquired new wants, and his dress was a mixture of his native and European fashions. Notwithstanding the intense cold without, his head was uncovered, but a profusion of long black coarse hair concealed his forehead, his crown, and even hung about his cheeks, so as to convey the idea to one who knew his present amid former conditions, that he encouraged its abundance as a willing veil to hide the shame of a noble soul, mourning for glory once known. His forehead, when it could be seen, appeared lofty, broad, and noble. His nose was high, and of the kind called Roman, with nostrils that expanded. In his seventieth year, with the freedom that had distinguished them in youth. His mouth was large but compressed, and possessing a great share of expression and character, and when opened it discovered a perfect set of short, strong, and regular teeth. His chin was full, though not prominent, and his face bore the infallible mark of his people in its square, high cheekbones. The eyes were not large, but their black orbs glittered in the rays of the candles, as he gazed intently down the hall, like two balls of fire. The instant that Mohegan observed himself to be noticed by the group around the young stranger, he dropped the blanket which covered the upper part of his frame from his shoulders, suffering it to fall over his leggings of untanned deerskin where it was retained by a belt of bark that confined it to his waist. As he walked slowly down the long hall, the dignified and deliberate tread of the Indian surprised the spectators. His shoulders and body to his waist were entirely bare, with the exception of a silver medallion of Washington that was suspended from his neck by a thong of buckskin and rested on his high chest amid many scars. His shoulders were rather broad and full, but the arms, though straight and graceful, wanted the muscular appearance that labor gives to a race of men. The medallion was the only ornament he wore, although enormous slits in the rim of either ear, which suffered the cartilages to fall two inches below the members, had evidently been used for the purpose of decoration in other days. In his hand he held a small basket of the ash wood slips, covered in diverse fantastical conceits, with red and black paints mingled with the white of the wood. As this child of the forest approached them, the whole party stood aside and allowed him to confront the object of his visit. He did not speak, however but stood fixing his glowing eyes on the shoulder of the young hunter, and then turning them intently on the countenance of the judge. The latter was a good deal astonished at this unusual departure from the ordinarily subdued and quiet manner of the Indian, but he extended his hand and said, Thou art welcome, John. This youth entertains a high opinion of thy skill, it seems, for he prefers thee to dress his wound even to our good friend, Dr. Todd. Mohican now spoke in tolerable English, but in a low, monotonous, guttural tone. The children of Mingon do not love the sight of blood, and yet young Eagle has been struck by the hand that should do no evil. Mohegan, old John, exclaimed the judge, thinkest thou that my hand was ever drawn human blood willingly? For shame, for shame, O John! Thy religion should have taught thee better. The evil spirit sometimes lives in the best heart, returned John, but my brother speaks the truth. His hand has never taken life when awake. 
no, not even when the children of the great English father were making the waters red with the blood of his people. Surely, John, said Mr. Grant, with much earnestness, you remember the divine command of our Savior. Judge not, lest ye be judged. What motive would Judge Temple have for injuring a youth like this, one to whom he is unknown, and from whom he can receive neither injury nor favor? John listened respectfully to the divine, and, when he had concluded, he stretched out his arm and said with energy, He is innocent. My brother has not done this. Marmaduke received the offered hand of the other with a smile that showed, however he might be astonished at his suspicion, he had ceased to resent it, while the wounded youth stood gazing from his red friend to his host, with interest powerfully delineated in his countenance. No sooner was this act of pacification exchanged than John proceeded to discharge the duty on which he had come. Dr. Todd was far from manifesting any displeasure at this invasion of his rights, but made way for the new leech with an air that expressed a willingness to gratify the humors of his patient, now that the all-important part of the business was so successfully performed, and nothing remained to be done but that what any child might effect. Indeed, he whispered as much to Monsieur Le Coy when he said, It is unfortunate. It was fortunate that the ball was extracted before this Indian came in, but any old woman can dress the wound. The young man, I hear, lives with John and Nanty Bumpo, and it's always best to humor a patient when it can be done discreetly. I say, discreetly, Monsieur. Certainment, returned the Frenchman. You seem very happy, Mr. Todd, in your practice. I think the other lady might very well finish what you so skillfully begin. But Richard had, at the bottom, a great deal of veneration for the knowledge of Mohican, especially in external wounds, and, retaining all his desire for a participation in glory, he advanced nigh the Indian and said, Sago, Sago, Mohican, Sago, my good fellow. I am glad you have come. Give me a regular physician like Dr. Todd to cut into flesh, and a native to heal the wound. Do you remember, John, the time when I and you set the bone of Natty Bumpo's little finger, after he broke it by falling from the rock when he was trying to get the partridge that fell on the cliffs? I never could tell yet whether it was I or Natty who killed that bird. He fired first and the bird stooped, and then it was rising again as I pulled trigger. I should have claimed it for a certainty, but Nanny said the hole was too big for shot, and he fired a single ball from his rifle. But the piece I carried then didn't scatter, and I have known it to bore a hole through a board when I've been shooting at a mark, very much like rifle bullets. Shall I help you, John? You know I have a knack at these things. Mohegan heard this disquisition quite patiently, and when Richard concluded, he held out the basket which contained his specifics, indicating by a gesture that he might hold it. Mr. Jones was quite satisfied with this commission, and ever after, in speaking of the event, was used to say that Dr. Todd and I cut out the bullet, and I and Indian John dressed the wound. The patient was much more deserving of that epithet while under the hands of Mohican than while suffering under the practice of the physician. Indeed, the Indian gave him but little opportunity for the exercise of a forbearing temper, as he had come prepared for the occasion. His dressings were soon applied, and consisted only of some pounded bark, moistened with a fluid that he had expressed from some of the simples of the woods. Among the native tribes of the forest there are always two kinds of leeches to be met with. The one placed its whole dependence on the exercise of supernatural power, 
and was held in greater veneration than their practice could at all justify. But the other was really endowed with great skill in the ordinary complaints of the human body, and was more particularly, as Natty had intimated, curious in cuts and bruises. While John and Richard were placing the dressings on the wound, Elnathan was acutely eyeing the contents of Mohegan's basket, which Mr. Jones, in his physical ardor, had transferred to the doctor, in order to hold himself one end of the bandages. Here he was soon enabled to detect sundry fragments of wood and bark, of which he quite coolly took possession, very possibly without any intention of speaking at all upon the subject. But when he beheld the full blue eye of Marmaduke watching his movements, he whispered to the judge, It is not to be denied, Judge Temple, but what the savages are knowing in small matters of physic. They hand these things down in their traditions. Now, in cancers and hydrophoby, they are quite ingenious. I will just take this bark home and analyze it for though it can't be worth sixpence to the young man's shoulder, it may be good for the toothache or rheumatism or some of them complaints. A man should never be above learning, even if it be from an Indian. It was fortunate for Dr. Todd that his principles were so liberal. As coupled with his practice, they were the means by which he acquired all his knowledge and by which he was gradually qualifying himself for the duties of his profession. The process to which he subjected the specific differed, however, greatly from the ordinary rules of chemistry, for, instead of separating, he afterward united the component parts of Mohegan's remedy, and thus was able to discover the tree whence the Indian had taken it. Some ten years after this event, when civilization and its refinements had crept, or rather rushed, into the settlements among these wild hills, an affair of honor occurred, and Elnathan was seen to apply a salve to the wound received by one of the parties, which had the flavor that was peculiar to the tree or root that Mohegan had used. Ten years later still, when England and the United States were again engaged in war, and the hordes of the western parts of the state of New York were rushing to the field, Elnathan, presuming on the reputation gained by these two operations, followed in the rear of a brigade or militia as its surgeon. When Mohegan had applied the bark, he freely relinquished to Richard the needle and thread that were used in sewing the bandages, for these were implements of which the native but little understood the use and stepping back with decent gravity, awaited the completion of the business by the other. "'Reach me the scissors,' said Mr. Jones, when he had finished, and finished for the second time, after tying the linen in every shape and form that it could be placed. "'Reach me the scissors, for here is a thread that must be cut off, or it might get under the dressing and inflame the wound. See, John?' I have put the lint I scraped between the two layers of linen, for though the bark is certainly best for the flesh, yet the lint will serve to keep the cold air from the wound. If any lint will do it good, it is this lint. I scraped it myself, and I will not turn my back at scraping lint to any man on the patent. I ought to know how, if anybody ought, for my grandfather was a doctor, and my father was a natural turn that way. Here, squire, is the scissors, said Remarkable, producing from beneath her petticoat of green moreen a pair of dull-looking shears. Well, upon my say-so, you've sewn that rags as well as a woman. As well as a woman, echoed Richard with indignation. What do women know of such matters? And you are proof of the truth of what I say. Who ever saw such a pair of shears used about a wound? Dr. Todd, I will thank you for the scissors from the case. Now, young man, I think you'll do. The shot has been neatly taken out. 
although perhaps, seeing I had a hand in it, I ought not to say so, and the wound is admirably dressed. You will soon be well again, though the jerk you gave my leaders must have a tendency to inflame the shoulder, yet you will do, you will do. You were rather flurried, I s suppose, and not used to horses, but I forgive the accident for the motive. No doubt you had the best of motives. Yes, now you will do. Then, gentlemen, said the wounded stranger, rising, and resuming his clothes, it will be unnecessary for me to trespass longer on your time and patience. There remains but one thing more to be settled, and that is our respectful rights to the deer, Judge Temple. I acknowledge it to be thine, said Marmaduke, and much more deeply am I indebted to thee than for this piece of venison. But in the morning thou wilt call here, and we can adjust this as well as more important matters. Elizabeth, for the young lady, being apprised that the wound was dressed, had re-entered the hall, thou wilt order a repast for this youth before we proceed to the church, and Aggie will have a sleigh prepared to convey him to his friend. But, sir, I cannot go without a part of the deer, returned the youth, seemingly struggling with his own feelings. I have already told you that I needed the venison for myself. Oh, we will not be particular, exclaimed Richard. The judge will pay you in the morning for the whole deer, and, remarkable, give the lad all the animal excepting the saddle, so on the whole I think you may consider yourself as a very lucky young man. You have been shot without being disabled, have had the wound dressed in the best possible manner here in the woods, as well as it would have been done in the Philadelphia hospital, if not better, have sold your deer at a high price, and yet can keep most of the carcass with the skin in the bargain. Marky, tell Tom to give him the skin too, and in the morning bring the skin to me, and I will give you half a dollar for it, or at least three and sixpence. I want just a skin to cover the pillion that I am making for Cousin Bess. I thank you, sir, for your liberality, and I trust am also thankful for my escape, returned the stranger. But you reserve the very part of the animal that I wished for my own use. I must have the saddle myself. Must, echoed Richard. Must is harder to be swallowed than the horns of the buck. Yes, must, repeated the youth, when turning his head proudly around him, as if to see who would dare to controvert his rights, he met the astonished gaze of Elizabeth, and proceeded more mildly. That is, if a man is allowed the possession of that which his hand hath killed, and the law will protect him in the enjoyment of his own. The law will do so, said Judge Temple, with an air of mortification mingled with surprise. Benjamin! See that the whole deer is placed in the sleigh, and have this youth conveyed to the hut of Leatherstocking. But, young man, thou hast a name, and shall I see you again in order to compensate thee for the wrong I have done thee? I am called Edwards, returned the hunter. Oliver Edwards. I am easily to be seen, sir, for I live nigh by, and am not afraid to show my face having never injured any man. "'It is we who have injured you, sir,' said Elizabeth. "'And the knowledge that you decline our assistance would give my father great pain. He would gladly see you in the morning.' The young hunter gazed at the fair speaker until his earnest look brought blood to her temples. When, recollecting himself, he bent his head, dropping his eyes to the carpet, and replied, In the morning, then, will I return and see Judge Temple, and I will accept his offer of the sleigh in token of amity. Amity! repeated Marmaduke. There was no malice in the act 
that injured the young man, there should be none in the feelings which it may engender. Forgive our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, observed Mr. Grant. It is the language used by our divine master himself, and it should be the golden rule with us, his humble followers. The stranger stood a moment, lost in thought, and then, glancing his dark eyes rather wildly around the hall, he bowed low to the divine and moved from the apartment with an air that would not admit of detention. "'Tis strange that one so young should harbor such feeling of resentment," said Marmaduke, when the door closed behind the stranger. "'But while the pain is recent and the sense of the injury so fresh, he must feel more strongly than in cooler moments. I doubt not we shall see him in the morning more tractable." Elizabeth, to whom this speech was addressed, did not reply, but moved slowly up the hall by herself, fixing her eyes on the little figure of the English ingrain carpet that covered the floor, while on the other hand Richard gave a loud crack with his whip as the stranger disappeared and cried, Well, Duke, you are your own master, but I would have tried law for the saddle before I would have given it to the fellow. Do you not own the mountains as well as the valleys? Are not the woods your own? What right has this chap, or the leather stocking, to shoot in your woods without your permission? Now I have known a farmer in Pennsylvania order a sportsman off his farm with as little ceremony as I would order Benjamin to put a log in the stove by the by. Benjamin, see how the thermometer stands? Now! If a man has a right to do this on a farm of a hundred acres, what power must a landlord have who owns sixty thousand, I? For the matter of that, including the late purchases, a hundred thousand. There is Mohican, to be sure. He may have some right, being a native, but it's little the poor fellow can do now with his rifle. How is this managed in France, Monsieur Lacoy? Do you let everybody run over your land in that country, helter-skelter, as they do here, shooting the game so that a gentleman has but little or no chance with his gun? Bah, diable, no, Mr. Dick, replied the Frenchman. We give in France no liberty except to the laddie. Yes, yes, to the woman, I know, said Richard. That is your Salic law. I read, sir, all kinds of books of France as well as England, of Greece, as well as Rome. But if I were in Duke's place, I would stick up advertisements tomorrow morning forbidding all persons to shoot or trespass in any manner on my woods. I could write such an advertisement myself in an hour, as would put a stop to the thing at once. Rickert, said Major Hartman, very coolly knocking the ashes from his pipe into the spitting box by his side. Now listen, I have lived seventy-five years on to Merhawk and inter woods. You had better meddle as meet der devil as meet der hunters. They leave meet their gun, and a rifle is better as to law. Ain't Marmaduke a judge? said Richard indignantly. Where is the use of being a judge or having a judge, if there is no law? Damn the fellow! I have a great mind to sue him in the morning myself, before Squire Doolittle, for meddling with my leaders. I am not afraid of his rifle. I can shoot, too. I have hit a dollar many a time at fifty rods. Thou hast missed more dollars than ever thou hast hit, Dickon, exclaimed the cheerful voice of the judge. But we will now take our evening's repast, which I perceive by remarkable physiognomy is ready. Monsieur Lacoy, Miss Temple, has a hand at your service. Will you lead the way, my child? Ah, ma chère mademoiselle, comme de soi enchanté, said the Frenchman. Il ne manque que les dames de fer un paldi de Templeton. Mr. Grant and he can continued in the hall, 
while the remainder of the party withdrew to an eating parlor, if we exempt Benjamin, who civilly remained to close the rear after the clergyman, and to open the front door for the exit of the Indian. John, said the divine, when the figure of Judge Temple disappeared, the last of the group, tomorrow is the festival of the nativity of our blessed Redeemer, when the church has appointed prayers and thanksgiving to be offered by her children, and when all are invited to partake of the mystical elements. As you have taken up the cross, and become a follower of good, and an escure of evil, I trust I shall see you before the altar, with a contrite heart and a meek spirit. John will come, said the Indian betraying no surprise, though he did not understand all the terms used by the other. Yes, continued Mr. Grant, laying his hand gently on the tawny shoulder of the aged chief, but it is not enough to be there in the body. You must come in the spirit and in truth. The Redeemer died for all, for the poor Indian as well as for the white man. Heaven knows no difference in color, nor must earth witness a separation of the church. It is good and profitable, John, to freshen the understanding and support the wavering by the observance of our holy festivals. But all form is but stench in the nostrils of the Holy One, unless it be accompanied by a devout and humble spirit. The Indian stepped back a little, and raising his body to its utmost powers of erection, he stretched his right arm on high, and dropped his forefinger downward, as if pointing from the heavens. Then, striking his other hand on his naked breast, he said with energy, The eye of the Great Spirit can see from the clouds. The bosom of Mohican is bare. It is well, John, and I hope you will receive profit and consolation from the performance of this duty. The Great Spirit overlooks none of his children, and the man of the woods is as much an object of his care as he who dwells in a palace. I wish you a good night, and pray God bless you." The Indian bent his head, and they separated, the one to seek his hut, and the other to join his party at the supper-table. While Benjamin was opening the door for the passage of the chief, he cried, in a tone that was meant to be encouraging, The parson says the word that is true, John. If he be that that they took of the color of the skin in heaven, why they might refuse to matter of their books a Christian born like myself, just for the matter of a little tan, from cruising in warm latitudes. Though for the matter of that, this damn nor'wester is enough to whiten the skin of a blackamoor. Let the reef out of your blanket, man, or your red hide will hardly weather the night without a touch from the frost. End of chapter 7 This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania in January of 2009Chapter 8 of The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, a descriptive tale by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 8 Quote, for here the exile met from every clime, and spoke in friendship every distant tongue. Unquote. Campbell. We have made our readers acquainted with some variety in character and nations in introducing the most important personages of this legend to their notice. But 
In order to establish the fidelity of our narrative, we shall briefly attempt to explain the reason why we have been obliged to present so motley a dramatis personae. Europe, at the period of our tale, was in the commencement of that commotion which afterward shook her political institutions to the center. Louis the Sixteenth had been beheaded, and a nation once esteemed the most refined among the civilized people of the world was changing its character and substituting cruelty for mercy and subtlety and ferocity for magnanimity and courage. Thousands of Frenchmen were compelled to seek protection in distant lands, among the crowds who fled from France and her islands to the United States of America, was the gentleman whom we have already mentioned as Monsieur Le Coy. He had been recommended to the favor of Judge Temple by the head of an eminent mercantile house in New York, with whom Marmaduke was in habits of intimacy, and accustomed to exchange good offices. At his first interview with the Frenchman, our judge had discovered him to be a man of breeding, and one who had seen much more prosperous days in his own country. From certain hints that had escaped him, Monsieur Le Coy was suspected of having been a West India planter, great numbers of whom had fled from St. Domingo and the other islands, and were now living in the Union, in a state of comparative poverty, and some in absolute want. The latter was not, however, the lot of Monsieur Le Coy. He had but little, he acknowledged, but that little was enough to furnish, in the language of the country, an assortment for a store. The knowledge of Marmaduke was eminently practical, and there was no part of a settler's life with which he was not familiar. Under his direction, Monsieur Le Coy made some purchases, consisting of a few cloths, some groceries, with a good deal of gunpowder and tobacco, a quantity of ironware, among which was a large portion of Barlow's jack-knives, potash kettles, and spiders, a very formidable collection of crockery of the coarsest quality and most uncouth forms, together with every other common article that the art of man has devised for his wants, not forgetting the luxuries of looking-glasses and jews harps. With this collection of valuables, Monsieur Le Coy had stepped behind a counter, with a wonderful pliability of temperament, and dropped into his assumed character as gracefully as he had ever moved in any other. The gentleness and suavity of his manners rendered him extremely popular. Besides this, women soon discover that he had taste. His calicoes were the finest, or in other words, the most showy, of any that were brought into the country and it was impossible to look at the prices asked for his goods by so pretty a spoken man. Through these conjoint means, the affairs of Monsieur Le Coy were again in a prosperous condition, and he was looked up to by the settlers as the second best man on the patent. Footnote. The term patent, which we have already used, and for which we may have further occasion, meant the district of country that had been originally granted to old Major Effingham by the King's Letters Patent, and which had now become, by purchase under the Act of Confiscation, the property of Marmaduke Temple. It was a term in common use throughout the new parts of the state, and was usually annexed to the landlord's name as, quote, Temple's or Effingham's Patent, unquote. End footnote. Major Hartman was a descendant of a man who, in company with a number of his countrymen, had immigrated with their families from the banks of the Rhine to those of the Mohawk. This migration had occurred as far back as the reign of Queen Anne, and their descendants were now living in great peace and plenty on the fertile borders of that beautiful stream. The Germans, or High Dutchers as they were called, to distinguish them from the original or low Dutch colonist, were a very peculiar people. They possessed all the gravity of the latter, without any of their phlegm, and like them, the High Dutchers, were industrious, honest, and economical. 
Fritz, or Frederick Hartman, was an epitome of all the vices and virtues, foibles and excellences of his race. He was passionate, though silent, obstinate, and a good deal suspicious of strangers, of immovable courage, inflexible honesty, and undeviating in his friendships. Indeed, there was no change about him unless it were from grave to gay. He was serious by months and jolly by weeks. He had, early in their acquaintance, formed an attachment for Marmaduke Temple, who was the only man that could not speak high Dutch that ever gained his entire confidence. Four times in each year, at periods equidistant, he left his low stone dwelling on the banks of the Mohawk and traveled thirty miles through the hills to the door of the mansion house in Templeton. Here he generally stayed a week and was reputed to spend much of that time in riotous living, greatly countenanced by Mr. Richard Jones. But every one loved him, even to remarkable Pettibone, to whom he occasioned some additional trouble. He was so frank, so sincere, and at times so mirthful. He was now on his regular Christmas visit, and had not been in the village an hour when Richard summoned him to fill a seat in the sleigh to meet the landlord and his daughter. Before explaining the character and situation of Mr. Grant, it will be necessary to recur to times far back in the brief history of the settlement. There seems to be a tendency in human nature to endeavor to provide for the wants of this world before our attention is turned to the business of the other. Religion has a quality but little cultivated amid the stumps of Temple's patent for the first few years of its settlement, but as most of its inhabitants were from the moral states of Connecticut and Massachusetts, when the wants of nature were satisfied, they began seriously to turn their attention to the introduction of those customs and observances which had been the principal care of their forefathers. There was certainly a great variety of opinions on the subject of grace and free will among the tenantry of Marmaduke, and, when we take into consideration the variety of the religious instruction which they received, it can easily be seen that it could not well be otherwise. Soon after the village had been formally laid out into the streets and blocks that resembled a city, a meeting of its inhabitants had been convened to take into consideration the propriety of establishing an academy. The measure originated with Richard, who in truth was much disposed to have the institution designated a university or at least a college. Meeting after meeting was held for this purpose, year after year. The resolutions of these symbiages appeared in the most conspicuous columns of a little blue-looking newspaper that was already issued weekly from the garret of a dwelling-house in the village, and which the traveler might as often see stuck into the fissure of a stake erected at the point where the footpath from a log cabin of some settler entered the highway, as a post-office for an individual. Sometimes the stake supported a small box, and a whole neighborhood received a weekly supply of their literary wants at this point, where the man who rides post regularly deposited a bundle of the precious commodity. To these flourishing resolutions, which briefly recounted the general utility of education, the political and geographical rights of the village of Templeton to a participation in the favors of the regents of the university, the salubrity of the air, and the wholesomeness of the water, together with the cheapness of food and the superior state of morals in the neighborhood, were uniformly annexed in large Roman capitals. The names of Marmaduke Temple as chairman and Richard Jones as secretary. Happily, for the success of this undertaking, the regents were not accustomed to resist these appeals to their generosity, whenever there was the smallest prospect of a donation to second the request. Eventually, Judge Temple concluded to bestow the necessary land, and to erect the required edifice at his own expense. 
the skill of mr or as he was now called from the circumstance of having received the commission of a justice of the peace squire doolittle was again put in requisition and the science of mr jones was once more resorted to we shall not recount the different devices of the architects on the occasion nor would it be decorous to do so seeing that there was a convocation of the society of the ancient and honorable fraternity of the free and accepted masons at the head of whom was richard in the capacity of master doubtless to approve or reject such of the plans as in their wisdom they deemed to he for the best the knotty point was however soon decided and on the appointed day the brotherhood marched in great state displaying sundry banners and mysterious symbols each man with a little mimic apron before him from a most cunningly contrived apartment in the garret of the bold dragoon and in kept by one captain hollister to the site of the intended edifice here richard laid the cornerstone with suitable gravity amidst an assemblage of more than half of the men and all the women within ten miles of templeton in the course of the succeeding week there was another meeting of the people not omitting swarms of the gentler sex when the abilities of hiram at the square rule were put to the test of experiment the frame fitted well and the skeleton of the fabric was reared without a single accident if we accept a few falls from horses while the laborers were returning home in the evening from this time the work advanced with great rapidity and in the course of the season the labor was completed the edifice manding in its heatity and proportions the boast of the village the study of young aspirants of for architectural fame and the admiration of every settler on the patent it was a long narrow house of wood painted white and more than half windows and when the observer stood at the western side of the building the edifice offered but a small obstacle to a full view of the rising sun it was in truth a very comfortless open place through which the daylight shone with natural facility on its front were diverse ornaments in wood designed by richard and executed by hiram but a window in the centre of the second story immediately over the door or grand entrance and the steeple were the pride of the building the former was we believe of the composite order for it included in its composition a multitude of ornaments and a great variety of proportions it consisted of an arched compartment in the centres with a square and small division on either side the whole encased in heavy frames deeply and laboriously moulded in pine wood and lighted with a vast number of blurred and green-looking glass of those dimensions which are commonly called eight by ten blinds that were intended to be painted green kept the window in a state of preservation and probably might have contributed to the effect of the whole had not the failure in the public funds which seems always to be incidental to any undertaking of this kind left them in the sombre coat of lead color with which they had been originally clothed the steeple was a little copula reared on the very centre of the roof on four tall pillars of pine that were fluted with a gouge and loaded with mouldings on the tops of the columns was reared a dome or copula resembling in shape an inverted teacup without its bottom from the centre of which projected a spire or shaft of wood transfixed with two iron rods that bore on their ends the letters n s e and w in the same metal the whole was surmounted by an imitation of one of the finny tribe carved in wood by the hands of richard and painted what he called a scale color this animal mr jones affirmed to be an admirable resemblance of a great favorite of the epicures of that country which bore the title of lake fish and doubtless the assertion was true for although intended to answer the purposes of a weathercock the fish was observed invariably 
to look with a longing eye in the direction of the beautiful sheet of water that lay embedded in the mountains of Templeton. For a short time after the Charter of the Regents was received, the trustees of this institution employed a graduate of one of the eastern colleges to instruct such youth as aspired to knowledge within the walls of the edifice which we have described. The upper part of the building was in one apartment, and was intended for gala days and exhibitions, and the lower contained two rooms that were intended for the great divisions of education, viz., the Latin, and the English scholars. The former were never very numerous, though the sounds of nominative, penia, genitive, penny, were soon heard to issue from the windows of the room, to the great delight and manifest edification of the passenger. Only one laborer in this temple of Minerva, however, was known to get so far as to attempt the translation of Virgil. He indeed appeared at the annual exhibition to the prodigious exultation of all his relatives, a farmer's family in the vicinity, and repeated the whole of the first eclogue from memory, observing the intonations of the dialogue with much judgment and effect. The sounds as they proceeded from his mouth of Tiddy re to patty li re cubans subjitimifi fagi Silvestrim tinonumus rom meditaris avene were the last that had been heard in that building, as probably they were the first that had ever been heard in the same language, there or anywhere else. By this time the trustees discovered that they had anticipated the age, and the instructor or principal was superseded by a master, who went on to teach the more humble lesson of the more haste the worse speed, in good, plain English. From this time until the date of our incidents, the academy was a common country school, and the great room of the building was sometimes used as a courtroom at extraordinary trials, sometimes for conferences of the religious and morally disposed in the evening, at others for a ball in the afternoon, given under the auspices of Richard, and on Sundays, invariably, as a place of public worship. When an itinerant priest of the persuasion of the Methodist, Baptist, Universalist, or of the more numerous sect of the Presbyterians, was accidentally in the neighborhood, he was ordinarily invicted to officiate, and was commonly rewarded for his services by a collection in a hat, before the congregation separated. When no such regular minister offered, a kind of colloquial prayer or two was made by some of the more gifted members, and a sermon was usually read from Stern by Mr. Richard Jones. The consequence of this desultory kind of priesthood was, as we have already intimated, a great diversity of opinion on the more abstruse points of faith. Each sect had its adherents, though neither was regularly organized and disciplined. Of the religious education of Marmaduke we have already written, nor was the doubtful character of his faith completely removed by his marriage. The mother of Elizabeth was an Episcopalian, as indeed was the mother of the judge himself, and the good taste of Marmaduke revolted at the familiar colloquies which the leaders of the conferences held with the deity in their nightly meetings. In form he was certainly an Episcopalian, though not a sectary of that denomination. On the other hand, Richard was as rigid in the observance of the canons of his church as he was inflexible in his opinions. Indeed, he had once or twice essayed to introduce the Episcopal form of service on the Sundays that the pupil was vacant, but Richard was a good deal addicted to carrying things to an excess and then there was something so papal in his air that the greater part of his hearers deserted him on the second Sabbath. On the third his only auditor was Ben Pump, who had all the obstinate enlightened orthodoxy of a high churchman. Before the War of the Revolution the English church was supported in the colonies by much interest by some of its inheritance in the mother country and a few of the congregations were very amply endowed. But for the season after the independence of the states was established, 
This sect of Christians languished for the want of the highest order of its priesthood. Pious and suitable divines were at length selected and sent to the mother country to receive that authority which, it is understood, can only be transmitted directly from one to the other, and thus obtain in order to reserve that unity in their churches, which properly belong to a people of the same nation. But unexpected difficulties presented themselves in the oaths with which the policy of England had fettered their establishment, and much time was spent before a conscientious sense of duty would permit the prelates of Britain to delegate the authority so earnestly sought. Time, patience, and zeal, however, removed every impediment, and the venerable man who had been set apart by the American churches, at length, returned to their expecting diocese, endowed with the most elevated functions of their earthly church. Priests and deacons were ordained, and missionaries provided, to keep alive the expiring flame of devotion in such members as were deprived of the ordinary administrations by dwelling in new and unorganized districts. Of this number was Mr. Grant. He had been sent into the county of which Templeton was the capital, and had been kindly invited by Marmaduke, and officiously pressed by Richard, to take up his abode in the village. A small and humble dwelling was prepared for his family, and the divine had made his appearance in the place but a few days previously to the time of his introduction to the reader. As his forms were entirely new to most of the inhabitants, and a clergyman of another denomination had previously occupied the field by engaging the academy, the first Sunday after his arrival was allowed to pass in silence. But now that his rival had passed on, like a meteor filling the air with the light of his wisdom, Richard was empowered to give notice that public worship, after the forms of the Protestant Episcopal Church, would be held on the night before Christmas, in the long room of the Academy in Templeton, by the Reverend Mr. Grant. This annunciation excited great commotion among the different sectaries. Some wondered as to the nature of the exhibition, others sneered, but a far greater part Recollecting the essays of Richard in that way, and mindful of the liberality or rather laxity of Marmaduke's notions on the subject of sectarianism, thought it most prudent to be silent. The expected evening was, however, the wonder of the hour, nor was the curiosity at all diminished when Richard and Benjamin, on the morning of the eventful day, were seen to issue from the woods in the neighborhood of the village each bearing on his shoulders a large bunch of evergreens. This worthy pair was observed to enter the academy, and carefully to fasten the door after which their proceedings remained a profound secret to the rest of the village. Mr. Jones, before he commenced his mysterious business, having informed the schoolmaster, to the great delight of the white-headed flock he governed, that there would be no school that day. Marmaduke apprised of all these preparations by letter, and it was especially arranged that he and Elizabeth which should arrive in season to participate in the solemnities of the evening. After this digression, we shall return to our narrative. End of chapter 8 This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania, in January of 2009.